So there's a little rock elm sapling that's near my house. And the way that you can tell that it's rock elm is by the quirky branches. So the twigs that are, you know, two or three years old get these quirky ridges on them. So you can see that there. And, and that's quite useful for identifying rock elm. But sometimes it doesn't work and there's a few other species of elm around. So in this video I'm going to go through some of the ways that I identify elms in northeastern North America. Alright, so I went around and I collected some elm so we can do a little ID lesson about the different species, at least, that I have within walking distance of my house. This is pretty representative of the kinds of elms that you'll find in the wild in northeastern North America. So there's four species. The most common is American elm, uh, also known as white elm. That's Almus americana. Rock elm, also known as cork elm, which is almost Tomasii. Red elm, um, or slippery elm. Uh, which is Almus rubra and Siberian elm, um, which is Almus pumilla. So Siberian elm is the one that's not native, but it has established populations. Apparently it's actually somewhat invasive in the prairies. Um, here it's, you mostly see it uh, where it's been planted or just nearby escapes. It doesn't seem to be very common um, or naturalized. So here's a set of range maps showing the distribution of the elms that are native to northeastern North America. White elm or American elm is the most widespread and it's also the most common. Red elm or slippery elm is almost as widespread but it's less common. And rock elm is the rarest and it also has the smallest distribution. And within its distribution it tends to occur fairly patchily. So let's look at the differences between these species of elms just based on what we can see from the leafy twigs gathered in the fall. So I think the best thing to do is start with American elm or white elm because it's the most common. So probably 99 out of 100 elms that I have around me are American elm. And so I think what I'm going to do is compare the other ones to it and show um, how you can tell it from them. So American elm versus rock elm. Um, there are differences in the shapes of the trees and also the fact that rock elm usually but not always has corky branches. Um, but otherwise, uh, the leaves are actually quite similar. They're probably the most similar. Um, and you can see a color difference here and that seems to be somewhat consistent with rock elm being kind of a paler lime green. but. Um, you know, in the shade, so these were grown in the sun, and in the shade, you wouldn't see a difference. Shade-grown leaves. So, yeah, definitely don't rely on that. But it is something you might notice. Um, the actual difference is in the buds, like the winter buds. is probably the most reliable way to do it. So I'll see if I can get them beside each other here. All right, so here you can see the buds. So these are the buds that are gonna last for the winter. They'll be actually more prominent in the winter. So it can be uh, somewhat easier. Once you've got it down to elm, it can actually be uh, sometimes easier to tell them apart in the winter. Um, but here's the rock elm and you can see, zoom in, they've got extremely pointy buds and they'll get more pointy. So this will get more obvious. Um, and they tend to be uh, kind of have a, a big green tip or green or yellow or gold, but they're paler. They've got a paler colored, very pronounced tip to the buds. Whereas um, here's American elm and so there they are side by side. The American elm, sometimes it has a bit of a green tip, but it's not as pronounced. The buds are uh, not as long and not as pointy. Um, so, you know, if I'm ever not sure, I'm like, oh, maybe this is a rock elm. I just go find an American elm that's close by and remind myself what the difference is and um, match it. You know, it'll be matched to the time of year. So it takes care of that source of variation. So there's a major difference if you can't rely on the quirky branches or the general shape of the tree. Here's a rock elm twig. It's late October, so the winter buds are more developed and you can see that they're pointy, offset to the side, and golden tipped. 
Here's a closer view. Here's an American elm twig, also in late October, and you can see the difference between it and the rock elm more easily. Um, at this time of year, the lateral buds are more are, are less uh, pointed away from the twig, and the buds are brown and they're not as pointy, and they don't really have that pronounced golden tip. Okay, next we have American elm versus slippery elm or red elm. So. Oftentimes, like if you look it up in a field guide, it'll be called slippery elm, um, but the lumber tends to be called red elm. Slippery elm tends to have bigger leaves. Um, <laughs> that is not consistent. It basically depends on how fast the twig was growing, what size the leaves are, and whether it's in the sun or the shade. So you got to be very careful. But on average, they're going to be bigger. But the, the biggest difference is that, and it's easier if you turn them over, is the vein pattern. So white elm or american elm it doesn't have a lot of branching especially towards the front of the leaf right they just the veins the lateral veins just tend to be pretty straight you know if you look really closely you're like oh is it branched that's not what we're talking about um, sometimes it has one branch like this one does especially towards the back of the leaf so if you look at the back of the leaf sometimes you'll see them but on slippery elm you get way more branching so look at this one Okay, not just the back of the leaf, the front of the leaf, branch, 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 branch. So you get a lot. And this is one of those things where you can, you know, if you find a slippery elm, you're like, well, oh, maybe, I'm not sure. You can usually find an American elm nearby until, you know, kind of recalibrate yourself. There's also differences in the buds. So slippery elm tends to have kind of stubbier, darker colored, often fatter buds. So uh, this faster growing twig, so this is a, a fast growing twig. This is a slow growing twig, same tree, um, but this got a great big kind of fat bud. And so they, they do tend to be bigger than American elm. So this is American elm, this is slippery elm. So that's another difference uh, that you can tell in the winter. Um, and that of course is, this is very different than rock elm. Here's a slippery elm twig in late October. And you can see the white borders on the scales clearly, and the buds that are um, really dark colored. They're not quite as pointy as American elm or rock elm. Another thing to look for in the slippery elm buds is red hairs, fine red hairs, as well as white edges to the bud scales. The other difference is uh, you kind of have to be there in person, but uh, slippery elm leaves are very rough. Like all elm leaves are kind of rough, but slippery elm leaves are like they're so bristly they're a little bit sticky to touch they almost want to stick to your skin so that's that's something that can be helpful too the teeth on slippery elm tend to be smaller than the teeth on american elm or white elm at least um at least on the back of the leaf the bristles on the leaves make the foliage look kind of matte and that combined with the fact that the serrations are less prominent and the leaves are bigger and they're often folded gives uh, slippery elm foliage a kind of a look from a distance that you can sometimes recognize at least enough to go and take another look to see if it is slippery elm so sometimes it's recognizable even when you're driving by once you've seen it a few times all right so now we've got american elm versus siberian elm so siberian elm is obviously not native to north america it's actually an invasive species i think in the prairies it's not common where i am but this is one that kind of escaped from where it was planted in somebody's yard. Um, its parent was planted. And the biggest difference is the small leaves. Siberian elm just has a lot smaller leaves. Um, the difference isn't always this big, but it's pretty consistent. One of the confusing things is that even though, all right, so now I'm bringing in the slippery elm or red elm, okay? <laughs> even though these are probably the two most different ones, the ones with the biggest leaves, um, versus the one with the smallest and they don't look uh, similar at all they are actually two that hybridize so i have never seen the hybrids but i think in, in places where wild siberian elms are common um, they have escaped and also slippery elms are common i think you you can find the hybrids so that's something to <laughs> i don't know worry about i guess if you're if you're really trying to get good ids but um, and it probably affects the lumber, actually, because Siberian elm lumber is not reputed to be good, although I can't speak from any experience.
All right, so let's look back at the at the American elm. So if you look at the leaves, um, and this can actually help you tell it from, say, a beech, if you're confused about that, is that uh, most elms are double toothed. So you have like a big tooth and then a little tooth, right? So it's actually each each of these teeth is actually two teeth, okay, double toothed, and Oftentimes I've seen Siberian elm, it's described as having this distinguishing character of being single-toothed. And um, that is sometimes true on some teeth, on some leaves, uh, but it doesn't seem to be consistently true. Because if you look um, at this, you can see that it's got some, it's got kind of double teeth on this, on this leaf. This one, not so much until like uh, the tip. So yeah, maybe there's something I've, I've always misunderstood about that, about that character. But yeah, people try to use that um, as a distinguishing character and, and it doesn't really seem to uh, be reliable in my opinion. But most of the time, there's not really a lot of uncertainty. I guess if you're looking at Siberian elm in the winter, uh, one giveaway might be the tiny buds. These are really small. Uh, here they are compared to slippery elm. Oh, the slippery elm is way, way bigger. Here's the Siberian elm twig from late October. One thing to notice is that, the, is that the leaves are still on it, so they retain leaves longer than the other species of elms. And the other thing to notice is the small round buds, which look sort of like tiny slippery elm buds, but they're much smaller. So I've pulled the leaves off a couple of these twigs so you can see the buds more easily and I can show them uh, side by side. American elm, rock elm, slippery elm, and the Siberian elm. So the Siberian elm, it does have little tiny buds. There's a difference in shape and color between the American elm and the rock elm, but sometimes it really helps uh, to look at them side by side. So. Usually if you find a suspected rock elm, you can find an American elm nearby to compare it to. And then here's the slippery elm, dark, um, kind of a little bit squatter, fatter uh, than the other two. So hopefully that will be a little bit helpful. Sometimes looking at the buds is more helpful than the leaves. Um, and whenever you're trying to identify anything, especially if, it's, if there's some lookalikes, it's always best to look at more than one thing. You know, don't just look at the at the leaves, look at the buds. Don't just look at the buds, look at the bark. Um, when it comes to elms, at least for these uh, three species, I find the bark is very similar among them. Uh, so maybe someone can tell them apart looking at the bark, but I, I typically can't. Um, but the shapes of the trees are different. The buds are different uh, and the leaves are different. And also uh, the wood is different. So there's differences in um, the structure of the wood between the hard elms and the soft elms. And of the, of the four species I've shown here, the only hard elm is the rock elm. So the other elms are considered soft elms. Now that's relative because uh, they're still um, fairly hard woods. Um, and even uh, red elm is sometimes used for ax handles even though it's not a hard elm. So Rock elm is even harder than that. So, the yeah, the structure is different. And I'll see if I can get uh, some images to show you what that looks like. You can tell some species of elm apart by looking at the wood and looking at the size and arrangement of the pores. So those are the, the xylem vessels that sap flows through in the sapwood and used to flow through in the heartwood. So in this ax uh, here, I've got rock elm, sapwood, and I've got American elm, heartwood. So um, I've also got a little uh, magnifying clip uh, that I can attach to my phone here that I'm filming with. So I'm gonna do that and see if I can show you guys the difference. All right, so in this image, you can see the rock elm sapwood, which is pale, and the white elm heartwood, which is dark. And, you know, I can kind of make out the features that I want to show you guys, but it's all clogged up with sandpaper dust and linseed oil, so it doesn't show up as well as it could. So I'm actually going to switch over to two different pieces of wood 
that I think we can get a better look at the features that I want to show. So I've just got a piece of American elm here that I just uh, was cutting up uh, the other day and I'm going to try it with this. So let's zoom into this. So I've zoomed in on the end grain of this American elm or white elm and you can see the early wood with the big pores that I've marked in blue and there's arrows showing the direction of growth. And I'm also going to mark where the early wood pores are in blue and then some example late wood pores in red. And so you can see that the early wood pores are very, very large compared to the much smaller late wood pores. And that's a distinguishing characteristic of soft elms. Red elm or slippery elm, from my understanding, um, although I haven't seen it in person, but from my understanding, it would be similar except that the large rows of early wood pores, there would be uh, three to five of them instead of one to two that white or American elm has. All right, rock elm on the left, I just sheared off a chunk, so let's zoom in on the end grain. So looking at the end grain of rock elm, you can tell that the early wood, which is again marked in blue, and there's also blue arrows showing the direction of growth, you can see that the pores in the early wood are not that much bigger than the pores in the late wood. So there's a bunch of rows of small early wood pores instead of fewer rows of very large early wood pores. Um, and that's what distinguishes rock elm with the small early wood pores from the soft elms, red and white elm that have large early wood pores. My source for this is the wood database, uh, which points out that the other hard elms in North America, so those are elms found further south in the US, cedar elm, September elm, and winged elm, will have the same structure as rock elm. So you can't tell all the species apart from each other, but you can tell soft elms from hard elms. And it's also important to note that this does not apply to elms from other continents. So you wouldn't use this for European elms because um, they just don't necessarily follow the same rules. The species of elm that we're considering here have seeds that ripen in late spring, and the seeds can also be used to differentiate the species. You can see that the seeds of American elm, which are furry and have a little kind of pincher tips, are quite different than slippery elm, which are bigger and mostly uh, lack hair. They just kind of have like this big floppy disc around them. Um, I don't have any pictures of rock elm, but its seeds would look similar to American elm. Quite furry, they don't have the prominent pinchers, so you can tell them apart that way. Here's an elm that I felled, and what I want to show you with this one is uh, something about the bark. So, it, you wouldn't necessarily want to do this on a live tree if you don't really need to, but on American elm and rock elm, but not slippery elm, there's these white layers in the bark that are sandwiched in there. So that's the white layer that I'm talking about right there. Again, you wouldn't do this on a living tree. All right, so in that cross-section view, you can see all those white layers sandwiched in there. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, rock elm will, will have this, so it won't help distinguish between rock elm and American elm, but slippery elm will not. So it will help distinguish that species. A major difference among the species of native elm is the form of their growth. So the silhouette of the tree, basically white elm or American elm is very distinctive. It's a very graceful tree. It has a straight trunk that opens up into large ascending branches that eventually droop back down uh, immature trees, um, creating kind of a, an umbrella effect. And that's why it was such a popular shade tree. Slippery elm is also a graceful tree, but it tends to not have uh, the branch, the branches descending or spreading out as far. And then rock elm is a robust tree, kind of, and it's got uh, gnarly branches. It often has a lot of branches uh, lower down that kind of uh, hang a bit off um, outward and downward from the trunk. I'll show more examples of the growth forms of these species later on in the video, as well as some Siberian elm. It can be tricky to identify forest grown trees because they're so tall often that the leaves are well out of reach. Um, and they tend to lack the characteristic shape that open grown trees have um, that's very, that's recognizable. So here is a great big tall white elm that is, is kind of tricky. I've got, uh, I'm looking at it from a couple different angles. 
I had a pair of binoculars with me. I tried to take a picture through my phone and I was pretty certain that it was a white elm, but not a hundred percent certain. And because it was dying of Dutch elm disease and almost dead, I used an ax and I chopped uh, a chip out of the trunk of the tree so that I could look at the end grain and confirm that it wasn't a rock elm. And with the bark layers, I could confirm it wasn't a slippery elm. Even with open grown elms, sometimes there's exceptions to the typical growth form. Um, even for American elm, which is normally so distinctive. Normally it's kind of got that vase or umbrella shape, but sometimes you see um, elms that are fairly columnar. And another thing that you see, and this can be in el white elms of different shapes, but you see some elms with like a whole bunch of small branches tight to the trunk. And I think of that as kind of elms with hairy legs. Um, Julie Ellen Rogers in uh, the book, The Trees Worth Knowing, she calls it feathered. Um, but yeah, either way, that's something that you can see sometimes. And then the tree I'm showing this photo on the far right is the most extreme I've seen of both of these traits. So this, this is a white elm, American elm, but it just goes straight up in kind of a straight column. And it, uh, it has a whole bunch of branches kind of feathering the trunk. So unfortunately this one died of Dutch elm disease recently. I ended up cutting it down. I've got a video about that. And when I felled it, I could count the growth lines. It was about a hundred years old and it was over 90 feet tall. So it was a big, peculiar specimen. But most white elms get to the typical vase or umbrella shape um, as they get larger uh, with or without hairy legs. Okay, let's take a drive around and look at some trees. Okay, so I stopped here on the side of the road to check out there's a great big, big huge elm, and uh, pretty sure it's an American elm, white elm. But yeah, it's a really big, nice one. I've noticed it a lot. I finally decided to stop, take some pictures of it. Here's another white elm. It's not quite as big as the last one, but it is pretty large and it's very picturesque. This one is a really good example of the typical vase-like or umbrella-like form of white elms. So here's a white elm or American elm, but the thing that's interesting about this is that it's one of those ones that has a lot of small twigs or kind of curly branches right up along the trunk. And that's something that's called feathering, or I like to think of it as elms with hairy legs. So there's a really large slippery elm. I'm not going to go over there just because that's by somebody's house and I don't want to be creepy, but it is the nicest one that's around uh, where I live that I know about. Here's a close one. It's not quite as big or nice, but it is, um, it does show some of the typical shape. Slippery elm doesn't have as a dramatic a form as white elm or even rock elm, but it is nice. It is a nice looking tree. And that's a large slippery elm back there, a tall tree. So here's a couple tricky elms that had me fooled because they don't have a really typical shape for white elm or American elm. I thought, oh, maybe these are slippery elm or rock elm. They don't have corky branches, but Sometimes Rock Elm doesn't, so I stop to check. And uh, yeah, this shows something. So I've got a twig here, and these are these are just white elm, and I can tell by by the leaf buds. But the confusing confusing thing is that they also have the flower buds. So these these really big fat buds, those are going to be the flowers. Um, in the spring, so this is this is October now. So there'll be there'll be flowers in the spring, and then these smaller buds. Those are the leaf buds, and those are the ones you want to look at um, to identify them. I mean, you can probably identify them based uh, based on the flower buds, but I don't know how. So, yeah, this is white elm, American elm. Don't mix up the flower buds with the leaf buds when you're identifying. 
something I didn't notice in person, but I did notice when I was editing this video together, is that one of these leaves shows signs of being attacked by Elm Zigzag Sawfly. So Elm Zigzag Sawfly is named after the pattern it leaves in the leaves, and it is a newly invasive insect um, that's spreading in eastern Ontario right now. Um, here's some other pictures that I took earlier in the year showing some of the damage uh, that it does to the leaves and a picture of the larva itself. I'm going to put a link in the video description to a, a video presentation on YouTube by Owen Clarkin that's going to have some more information about Elm Zigzag Softly if you want more details about that. All right, so I was driving by, saw this rock elm, decided to pull over and have a look at it. It's just on the side of the road here. And I did just have a false alarm um, with a with a American elm, but yeah, this one is a little more obvious, and <laughs> it's definitely a rock elm. So there's lots of smaller branches that kind of come off the main trunks. This one's multi, uh, double trunk, triple trunk, and kind of droops. So that's a hint, um, and then. The leaves are a slightly different color. They're a little smaller. I mean, it's, it's October right now, so it's losing leaves. Uh, the leaves are changing color and falling. But yeah, one look at the buds, and it's a big difference. Gives it right away. This is definitely a rock elm. Here's another roadside rock elm showing the typical structure for you know a smaller, mature one. As they get older, they spread out more if they're growing in the open. The gnarly tree on the right is a rock elm that died several years ago, but because it had thick corky branches and that rugged shape, it's still identifiable. If you look beside it, as I did, I noticed that there's actually a rock elm sapling coming up there. So its descendants live on. So here's an interesting juxtaposition. This tree here, the kind of gnarly dark one, not the little aspen in the front, is a rock elm. And right beside it is a bur oak that's the same size. And these trees are pretty similar. They both have kind of these corky, gnarly branches. Um, and they have a similar silhouette. And so they can be tricky to tell apart in the winter without the leaves, but you can actually see it here, I hope. This is the rock elm, and its twigs are much more delicate than the bur oak. So bur oak twigs are big, fat, mostly straight, and the rock elm twigs are smaller, delicate, and a bit zigzaggy, like other elms. Here's the, the twigs of bur oak and rock elm. This is a bur oak twig. And this is a rock elm twig. So here's a rock elm sapling that's nearby. And it gives you a look at the corky branches. Of course, this one's you know, the, the corky ridges are quite prominent. It's actually not always this easy to tell. Although, the buds are distinctive. So here's a row of Siberian elm that were planted. They're actually pretty nice looking for this species. And they look a lot in shape like American elm. I guess that's what they're meant to replace. There's one stump that sprouted, but anyway, yeah, you can tell them apart by <laughs> dead branches and uh, small leaves. So there you go. Here's a picture of another one showing the more typical scraggly appearance that this species tends to have in this climate. Here's a slippery elm, and this is a tall one. It's kind of getting crowded by these sugar maples. Um, Here's a view of the bark. <laughs> I'm not any good at using the bark to identify them, but there it is. Um, what I what I can do to identify slippery elm is, <laughs> you know, if it's if it's too tall for me to 
get a look at the buds and the leaves. Um, I just find some leaves on the ground and that can help. So all these divided veins and the texture um, show that this is slippery elm. And the other thing you can do, of course, is have a pair of uh, binoculars or even better, a camera with a good zoom lens. So after I saw Owen Clarkin's presentation to the Ontario uh, Woodlot Association, I realized that possibly the largest living rock elm in the world is, is very close to where I live. So here I am checking it out. There it is. It is, it is enormous. According to Owen's measurements or estimates, it's about 92 feet high. It's probably close to a meter dBH, um, maybe more. It is a really impressive tree. So here's some pictures that my partner Amanda took with her camera that can, can zoom up into the canopy. I'm going to end the video with a few clips from a walk I took with my dog last spring. It was hot, it was mosquito-y, but it was a really nice day and we went to see a rock elm um, at my sister's place. Well, the old dog and I are out here behind my sister's place. We've come to check out a rock elm. Now this is one I've known about for a little while. And I just want to see if it's still healthy because there's a lot of trees that are affected by Dutch elm disease. And it looks like it is. And I also want to see if there's any seeds on it. So it's the end of May and weirdly enough that's when elm seeds are ripening. And if there are any seeds I'll collect them but um, they only go to seed about once every four or five years, I guess. So, uh, you know, faint hope, but we'll see. Oh, here it is. I really like the look of these trees, just the gnarly branches and the heavy bark. They got a lot of character. This one's not too big, but mature. I don't. I don't see any seeds, which is too bad. It can be hard to learn how to identify them, but once you have, they do have, they do have a look. Not only is their shape different from the other elms, but the leaves are kind of a different color. They're kind of a yellow green, a lime green, um, instead of the dark rich green that like American elms have. And their buds are, of course, different, although this is May, so it's not a great time of year to see that. Of course, the corky ridges on the branches are a giveaway, but not all trees have it very well developed. This one is kind of moderate. It's, it's somewhat corky. I guess you'd probably be able to pick it out in the winter from a distance, but... You'd have to kind of know what you're looking for. Mm, looking at it from this side, it looks like one side is a little sparse. The side closest to that sugar maple might just not be getting enough, as much sun on that side. It's okay. Let's keep an eye on it. Check back next year. <laughs>